And with that in mind too, do you remember the point where you went from studying herbalism? And I know we study it forever because it's just, again, one of those things that you can always continue to unpack and try new herbs and, and all this sort of stuff that we're saying to actually feeling comfortable being able to say, I am a herbalist or was it, I don't know. I know personally, it's, it's almost easier to hear other people say that I am as opposed to mm -hmm. coming from my own mouth. <laughs> but I don't know if you ever experienced so that. Yeah, that happened like early for me um, because that same weekend that I went and met uh, Matthew Wood and Rosemary Gladstar and Paul Strauss down at the Botanical Sanctuary um, in Rutland, Ohio, the United Plant Savers Botanical Sanctuary. Um, that was like sort of, there's, there's an herbalist, I should say, the first like herbalist that I met was an herbalist in Detroit. His name's Gary Wantaja. He's got a shop called Nature's Products. And, you know, he's got like, I don't know, like 300 jars of dried bulk herbs in his shop. And you go in there and he fills up little bags for you. And he's got like a, a beam scale. It's pretty awesome. Um, and so he's like the first herbalist herbalist that I met who was really plant wise. Um, and the first like herbal community, anything I went to was this gathering with Rosemary and Matthew Wood, and then also Paul Strauss, because he's sort of like the steward of the sanctuary down there. And um, two funny things happened when I got up is the first thing is um, I was really unknown then. And as I walked up, you know, there were two young women um, signing people in doing registration for like the weekend. And one of them's like, you must be Jim McDonald. And I was just like, oh, wow, that's weird. And then they both cracked up and they're like, you're the only dude. <laughs> you know, because there were no other guys signed up. And I was like, oh, ha, ha. and then um, one of them said like, oh, are you an herbalist? And this is maybe, I mean, only like somewhere between three and four years into it. And I was like, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I must be right. Cause I, I, dig stuff up, I make things, I give them to myself and to other people. And um, I like the idea, and I feel kind of strongly about this, and I know other people feel differently, but I like the idea of like, if you're a person who loves plants and uses plants to help yourself and the people around you, whether it's just your immediate family or your small friend group or your extended community group or you're a clinical herbalist or whatever, like those are all herbalists. They're just different kinds of herbalists, right? And um, sometimes I feel like there are a lot of people who think like, oh, you know, you're not an herbalist until you're like a clinical herbalist or, you know, like you've had a certain amount of learning and, you know, then you can be called an herbalist. And we wouldn't say that about like someone being a cook and we wouldn't say that about someone being an artist or like you make your living doing it, right? It's like, you can be a cook, but not be a professional cook. You can be an artist, but not be a professional artist. You can be a photographer, but not be a professional photographer. Um, and all we need to do is like have herbalist be the inclusive term. And then if we need to, we can, we can add like an adjective to it and say clinical herbalist or family herbalist or community herbalist or, um, beginner herbalist or in some cases like not very good herbalist because there are those out there <laughs> <laughs> and you know like but I, I really want more people to call themselves herbalists mm. um because what else would you you know like if you're not an herbalist then what else are you you know mm. if you're the person that's like making stuff with plants and they're like a focal point in your life and and what what word would you use like why wouldn't you use herbalist and maybe the only reason is, you know, some people want to have a limited definition of herbalist so that it can be their, like theirs and people like them, you know? Yeah, I could see that. I, I get that. That's, I understand why they want to do that, but I don't want to do that. You know, I want, I want everyone to be like, oh yes, I'm an herbalist. And then realize that herbalist isn't an endpoint. Mm -hmm. Like herbalist is more like an acknowledgement. Um, but that said, like um, what you were saying about other people saying, um, you know, that you're an herbalist and that feeling more comfortable, I, I agree with that. And 
there's a spectacular guy uh, out in Eugene, Oregon named Howie Brownstein. Mm -hmm. And Howie, he posted online occasionally. I don't know that it's on his website, but um, every now and again, yeah. he'll post something he wrote up. It's maybe a couple paragraphs long or a few paragraphs long. And it's about like his students asking them, when am I an herbalist? And um, in a really well-written piece, he basically says like, you're an herbalist when your community decides that you were their herbalist, right? <laughs> and it doesn't necessarily correlate to how much education or training, formal or informal that you've had. It's just like when people are coming to you and they're like, you're my herbalist, then mm -hmm. yes, you're an herbalist. I love that. I love that for a few different reasons, because number one, it makes it more accessible to people when we think about it that way, you know, and it mm -hmm. reminds me back to the time when everyone living was an herbalist in some way, like we had to yeah. rely on plants for food, medicine, materials, everything we needed, right? And I think it speaks to the connection that we had so, so deeply way back when, you know, it's not so much that way now, but it makes me think about that too. And I think anybody who works with plants, why not consider themselves an herbalist? But I, I like what you were saying about when your community comes to you and that's kind of when you know, <laughs> that's a good yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, the, um, one of the, the big catapults, I guess, learning catapults, um, mm -hmm. is I got sort of like nagged into teaching classes. Um, and that would have been like, probably late 90s if I had to guess and I'm not entirely sure but like I would go places and you know things would happen to people they'd have a splinter they'd get bit by a mosquito bite they would step on a hot coal around the fire and I would wander off and come back and be like put that on it and I remember one time someone said do you notice it when he comes back <laughs> for like a burn around a fire like it's not the same thing every time you know it's like different things and um the place that I, I was at spending a lot of time at, you know, had classes and like, you should teach a class on this. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to teach classes. I don't know. And they, I got asked enough time and I'm like, ah, oh, okay. And so like the first class that I ever did was like a seven hour herb walk. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. With, it was kind of ridiculous. I think it was like $20. It was a seven hour herb walk. And, you know, there was like 30 pages of handouts and, um, I think back then of the first year of classes, like you also got lunch somehow and I gave everyone like a bottle of tincture. It was, um, I can't do that anymore. That's not a part of the thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's. Um, I, I probably am still struggling with pricing and trying to figure out like where like the, <laughs> the right ground is for all of that. Um, but when I did that, it's just really because I, you know, here in Michigan at the time, and things are actually considerably different now, but in Michigan at the time, in the part of Michigan that I was at, there weren't really many people doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so having people come to classes and ask questions and then show up at the next class and then maybe like say that what I suggested or the answer to my question either worked or didn't work or did this unusual thing or that, um, that's really what got me the experience having more than just like a small circle of friends and my wife to try stuff out on, right? I got a, a broader age range and a broader range of, you know, different issues that people had. Um, I made um, some good recommendations and some terrible recommendations. Like I still feel, <laughs> I still feel slightly bad for um, someone who had the rise that that, that no I think it was it was someone had their gallbladder out and you know I suggested um yellow doc decoctions and now that just sounds like oh that was mean you know? and even then I had I had drank yellow doc decoctions but I don't think I had ever drank them like day after day after day after day because there's a big difference between drinking something like once and being like oh wow that has a really interesting flavor and drinking something like most days, every week, week after week after week, when you get to the sort of point where you're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> I can't drink anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
So was it after that experience that led you down the educational path of herbalism? Is that kind of where yeah, it all started? Um, I, I, I taught the class and then because I did a spring walk, I was like, well, I guess I'm going to do like a summer walk and a fall walk. And then I was like, oh, you know, now it's cold and snowy. Uh, I guess I can do a class on like immune system herbs. And then in the winter, I guess in January, I did a class on like herbs and stress and nervous system stuff. And then for a long, the longest time, March was sort of like, I would think of some class that I could do and it might be respiratory stuff or digestive stuff. So it started off where I was teaching like every two months at this one location, um, Upland Hills Ecological Awareness Center, where I taught for, for decades. Um, and then, you know, students who came there would say like, oh, would you come here and teach? And would you come there and teach? And, you know, that happened. And there were times when the, the turnout was great. And there were times when the turnout was like depressing, <laughs> maybe not depressing, but like, <laughs> that made me think like, oh, you know, I, I would feel like really happy, like, oh, things are going really good. Maybe I should keep doing this. And then I'd have like really lousy turnout for a couple of classes and go like, oh, maybe this isn't going to pan out. Um, but mostly people said like, you know, you know, if they say like, how did you get to where you are? It's just largely because I just didn't stop doing anything. I just mm -hmm. kept teaching classes and I kept learning and I kept asking questions and I keep wondering about stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. 